Good morning, everybody. It's my honor and, and honor with my um, participants to be asked to be part of this panel. Um, again, you know, our panel is going to be dealing with uh, language access in, in for voting, critical thing for progressives, as well as the double standards we see with the recent war in Ukraine on uh, Ukrainian refugees versus other refugees. Uh, please, very important, I want everybody to remember this, we're not here in any way, shape, or form disparaging Ukrainian refugees. We all have been involved in working with refugees, uh, and I think we need to do more for the Ukrainian refugees. We need to do more for every refugee. But it's very, very critical, I think, for us as progressives to say that every F refugee is similar, right? We, we need to put more as, the, the, as Americans to welcome refugees, whether they're from Haiti or from Syria or from wherever, and from Ukraine. So at no point do we want to ever suggest that we're not, we're disparaging Ukrainian refugees. We're not. Okay, so we just want to point out the double standard. So, Pedro, if we could start that video, it would be great. And then we'll have Numa speak. I'll, I'll, um, well, before we do the video, let me just introduce Numa, who's going to be our first speaker. Numa St. Louis is a friend, but more importantly, he's a Philadelphia activist. He is the pol a policy or district rep and policy advisor to Congressman Dwight Evans. Uh, he's a, a great progressive. He's part of uh, a group that we have uh, in the city called United Voices. And he's someone who's a, a true believer, a true activist, and someone who gets things done. So, Pedro, can you shoot that video first? Sergeant Lee. Thank you. We're going to only watch a couple minutes of it. Uh, the video is made by a, a Palestinian American gentleman who grew up in the Philadelphia area. His name is Amr Zahar. He is a comedian, and um, he has been active in, in numerous progressive causes, particularly focusing with his background and his origin as a Palestinian American. So when we uh, get the video up. Can you see the uh, screen now? I don't see it. Hold on a second. All right. You see that screen, right? No. Do you guys see any screen? Hey, Marwan, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yeah. I'll, introduce, I'll introduce Andy and Al Sharif in a second, but let's start with Numa because he's, after me, he's the best looking of you guys up here. <laughs> so, um, Numa, we got some time until the video comes. Is there anything you want to start out with? Well, uh, I just want to say good morning to everyone, and it's an absolute pleasure to join um, this uh, panel with such a group of people that are so dedicated to progressive uh, values. Um, I know everyone in the panel. I've worked with them in different capacities. I know what it means to, to you to, uh, to adhere and follow progressive um, values. Uh, it's a pleasure, like I said, for me to be here to be part of this important discussion around refugees and um, voter access. With respect to uh, the refugee situation, um, I think we can certainly be proud of the way our government has handled the treatment of uh, the Ukrainians. Obviously, they've been subject to a war. They're inflicted with bombs, with destruction. And whenever people are going through that kind of like pain and suffering, you certainly want to make sure that you lay a hand and that you extend your heart. And I'm certainly proud of the way our government has treated the Ukrainian people. And I think it should be a case study, a, a model in terms of how we, we treat people that are seeking refuge, uh, that are uh, sort of like facing hard times. But there is a contrast. There is a contrast in terms of how we see the government treating uh, Europeans or Ukrainians in this situation. And I, for one, certainly believe that we should do everything possible to to uh, to help them, whether it's humanitarian aid, uh, logistics, resources, and so forth. But it, it behooves us to make sure that our government is keeping the same energy, 
have the same sort of like platform when it comes to other refugees, be it from Syria, from the Middle East, or or Haiti. So I certainly want to applaud the efforts that our government has undertaken with respect to, to, to Ukrainian, but we want to make sure that's a universal approach and not just sort of like lay that kind of hand or support when it's uh, folks um, f- uh, f- uh, f- from, from Europe. So I, I hope this is a precedent that our government is setting in terms of the way we treat uh, refugees um, going forward. Um, certainly, uh, I think the contrast uh, was several months ago, we saw that there was a there was a, an array of Haitians that came from, from South America uh, that made their way to the Texas border. And we saw the treatment was drastically different. M- many of them were subject to being whipped, were subject to imprisonment um, and unfair treatment. So again, we want to make sure that our government sort of like treats uh, people that are fleeing, be it for war or natural causes, with the same degree of love and, and support. So, and, Peter, any yeah. luck with getting the video on? Or uh, I'd have it on, but at, uh, let me see. Can you see it now? No. Nope. Mm-hmm. All right, that's it's not it's not hooking. Well, and and, and, and I'll close I'll, I'll close with this. I mean, we talk about from a policy standpoint, but it does not stay there. It, even with respect to the way the media talks about refugees, it's drastically different, right? So the language is important. The rhetoric that's utilized is is important in terms of how we view people's humanity, right? Um, and I think Marwan had a video that um, he's trying to, uh, to, to show, which highlights that, right? In terms of the, the way we treat, the way we talk, language is so, so important. Um, as we talk uh, about these things. Um, so again, I certainly w- w- want to highlight the, the importance of it from a policy standpoint, the way our government goes about it, but also sort of like the rhetoric, the language, and the way it's covered and, and the media. Yeah, and, and um, you know, I think one of the things that I've noticed is um, there's an infamous uh, radio or TV broadcast, I believe it was on CNN or MSNBC, I'm not sure which one, where the the uh, announcer says, in all due respect, these are civilized people. They are not like Afghanistanis or Syrians. They, you know, they're blonde haired blue eyes. And it's kind of like, wait a second, you know, let's 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 remember this. Let's let's put this in focus. Um, you know, it's interesting how especially Republican governors are falling all over each other about saying, yes, we'll take in refugees, the Ukrainian refugees, when I believe it was a couple dozen Republican governors who said, we will not allow any Syrian refugees to come into our state. Very, very true. Uh, We do see the difference. We do see the contrast. And that is why, you know, when it comes to refugees, we want to have a universal sort of like approach. You know, we can't compare people just because you're from a different continent differently, right? Uh, so we want to keep the same the same energy is what I keep um, telling people that let's use this as a model, as a precedent of the way um, we treat refugees, right? I mean, you know, like to uh, Marwan's point, Europe hasn't sort of like had to deal with this kind of stuff since World War II. So it's foreign to them, right? Um, but you see, irrespective of where you come from, when you are going through a war, War is brutal. War is, is 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 a terrible thing to endure. And people that are living through war needs help. Uh, not just war, but be it natural disasters, famine. You know, whenever people are going through these kind of like hardships, you know, and we fashion ourselves as America as 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 a country that cares, that's able to sort of like provide support, that's able to parachute in wherever we need to to provide um, resources. And, and we certainly want to create, um, you know, a, a venue whereby people that need assistance can come through. The other thing I've noticed is that uh, it, within Europe, we see um, both the Hungarian government, which is, I think, led by a fascist, Orban, uh, and the Polish government are, again, opening their doors for the Ukrainians, but they shut their doors. And even the Czech government shut the doors for the Syrian uh, uh, refugees. Uh, and, you know, at the beginning of the war, I think they got enough pressure that they stopped it. They would 
at when the Ukrainian when people fled Ukraine at the borders, they would take the darker people or the people who looked Muslim mm -hmm. and put them aside and only allow the the um, the uh, blonde hair, blue eyed people to right. Th that's something we we're certainly very concerned about. We saw images of. Uh, of people fleeing, obviously it's a desperate situation. People are trying to get out of there as you know as quick as they can. But we saw uh, once again, um, you know, Africans or colored people sort of like being put literally in the back of the train, or or not being allowed to cross, you know, uh, the borders or get on the train to flee. And we certainly flagged that uh, not just to the to the ambassador of Ukraine, but to the EU to say that. You know, as as Americans, we want to help. We're providing resources, but we expect equal treatment of everybody. We understand it's a very desperate situation, and obviously, uh, you have to prioritize. Be it women, children, we get that. But but the images we saw were just terrible, whereby they were just they were just not allowing Africans. And apparently, they're the sizable population. There are students from from Africa, from West Africa that, that were there studying. Uh, many of them are, are in law school or, or in medical school that were just having a hard time leaving um, Ukraine and not being allowed to sort of like get into like uh, neighboring countries. So that's certainly something that was uh, very problematic. I, I thought the imagery uh, was not good. And certainly, I mean, right now, there's a lot of like um, support and sympathy for for Ukraine, deservingly so. But the imagery that we saw from a from a black perspective sort of like dampened that, if you will. And we and and we're happy to hear that there there are some corrections being made. Right. And again, uh Numa, when you brought up the the those idea or the the image of uh ICE agents with on horseback whipping up using whips to uh attack Haitian refugees, uh to me that was that was damning. Remember those pictures? Yep. And, and, uh, you know, again, a refugee and I've been kind of a, you know, I don't, we had a flea of war, so I know what it's like. We weren't a refugee. I mean, we weren't exactly refugees, but we fled a war and, you know, anybody who has to fear and flee for their lives should have equal consideration, irregardless of their religious background, their ethnic, uh, 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 history or, or, or their ethnicity, maybe I should get my English words right, uh, et cetera. Um, Numa, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of move the discussion uh, off toward our other two guests, but we'll continue with this. Um, and first, I never introduced myself. I don't believe, Marwan, my name is Marwan Creedy. I'm active in uh, Philadelphia circles, progressive circles. I'm with the Philadelphia Arab American Development Corp and I teach at uh, Westchester University. And I'm one of these old time progressives like Andy. We've been here for a while. Sharif and Numar are kind of like the newer generation. So we're excited to have them both here. But one of the things that um, I've been working with all three of those individuals, including Mr. Rodriguez, is on uh, mobilizing Philadelphia to vote in the elections. And especially for people who are uh, the minorities. And when I talk about minorities in Philly, since we were in my you know, majority minority city, which is really exciting in my view. Um, and we have this uh, organization we put together, I, I don't know, about eight years ago, was it called uh, United Voices? And what we try to represent and try to um, work with are those na uh, national minorities or ethnic groups who are uh, not, the, not white or black, <laughs> They're pretty well organized in Philly. We're talking about Asians, Africans, um, uh, Latinos, Latinas, all those smaller groups to make sure that they have a voice. And uh, I've been working with them for a while. We've had, I believe, some sex. But the most exciting thing that we're doing right now is something that really Al Sharif has been part of, and Andy especially, is... You know, you can't vote, or it's more difficult to vote if you can't read um, the language on the ballot box. So they've been working really hard, much harder than me, on adding language access to our, our uh, voting uh, uh, operations in the electoral system. So, Andy, maybe you could start talking about that, and then uh, we'll hand it off to Al Sharif. Uh, again, Andy Toy is a, again, old-time 
of political activists in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, he ran for uh, at-large city council twice. And like when I ran for city uh, commissioner, we all lost. But that's okay. We stay involved and we, we get work harder the next time. And Andy is presently uh, working with the Philadelphia Association of CDCs. So Andy, why don't we start talking about language access at the ballot box? Sure. Thanks, Marwan. And uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or good evening. If you're viewing this later, hopefully people are going to see this at a later point. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to my fellow uh, friends and allies, Numa, brother from another mother. <laughs> Al Sharif, we've been working together really closely in the last year. Uh, well, actually, it's been a couple of years of this language access effort and Mar Marwan. Uh, who I always share beers with, and Pedro as well. Uh, we're we're all in this together, um, and I think that's part of uh, your message, Marwan. Is that um, uh, sorry about that? Um, that we we're stronger together. A lot of there are a lot of smaller groups um, that we represent: um, API, Latino, African, Caribbean, um, Arab American, you name it, Muslim. Um, that have not been at the table. And um, so bringing home the international sort of view to, to, to Philadelphia or United States is that uh, a lot of people come here um, feeling that they're not part of um, the, the conversation, that their voice doesn't count. Um, and yet we have a lot of people living in communities that have a lot of needs. Um, so I would just say that um, in, in my recent experience when I was at uh, CMAC, which is an organization in South Philadelphia, uh, a nonprofit organization uh, that works in a community, a very, one of the most diverse communities in Philadelphia, uh, we, we worked very hard to, to pull out people who didn't feel like they were part of um, the conversation or, or felt like they, when they went to meetings, they might, um, and this is where language access really comes into play. When they went to a meeting, we there would be a big meeting called and um pretty much dominated by young white um english-speaking professional voices um and people of color people um who are first generation or second generation um may have felt that they were not um going to be heard and that their that their viewpoints were not as valid so what we did was um often would we, we would we would have smaller meetings in language um, to get people to talk about something. So we were doing a, a plan for Mifflin Square Park and we had um, many smaller meetings first to really get people engaged in their own language and be able to understand that they had um, a view that should be uh, heard. And then the other part of it was we told people, if you really wanna see change in your neighborhood, you want resources, you have to be engaged. Uh, whether it's um, going to meetings or voting. Um, those who became citizens and we were helping people to become citizens, we said, as soon as you become a citizen, you need to register to vote. And then you need to be part of the, the process um, because your vote is as important as my vote, as you have as much power as Donald F and Trump in the White House because you have one vote, he has one vote. So um, don't feel like you don't have a have the power and uh, you can make a difference. Uh, we can make a difference. Um, so we we would put stuff out as well in in eight to 10 languages um, in the, the, the major languages in the community. There were even more than that, but that that was a real effort. And you have to make that effort. If you don't make that effort, you will not have those people involved. Um, and the same goes is true with voting. So um, uh, I believe that, you know, among us all here, we're, we're about building um, allyship, we're building partnerships, we're building uh, ways for all of us to be a part of the conversation. And if we do this right in places like Philadelphia, um, we have the power to be able to make a difference beyond Philadelphia. The upcoming election, for example, in the fall, uh, for governor and senator in Pennsylvania could be determined by a few thousand votes. And if we're doing our job by bringing in uh, immigrant refugee folks that don't normally feel like they're part of the process or young people who have um, 
traditionally not voted because they're not like feeling like they they don't know what the process is and they're not used to it. Um, if we do our job right, we'll we'll bring a thousands of more people to the polling places and they will be representing the views of what we want, um, the values that we, we feel are important and Philadelphia, what, what Philadelphia needs. So we won't be um, um, represented by people that um, are anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ, um, anti-people um, of color, um, anti-big cities. Uh, we need people that are, are going to represent us and we, we need um, our voice to be heard in that process. So I, I would say that, you know, the, the experience at CMAC leads into the experience of, of our work that was that United Voices and All Voting is Local, and I'll hand it off to Al Sharif, I have been doing um, in Philadelphia, not only with language access, but in access in general, but language access being a, a critical component to having um, everybody be heard and everybody be feeling that they're part of the system. Thanks. Andy, thanks. Let me just introduce Alex Sharif, but let, I want to make a quick note from the last election when we finally got uh, the Donald out of office. Hmm. Uh, if we look at Pennsylvania, the two counties that switched and were important in the 70,000 odd votes that uh, won the uh, state and in, in, in essence the country for uh, Joe Biden, um, with Northampton and Erie. And this is where we put a lot of effort in uh, in Northampton, Lehigh. That was the Arab American vote that switched, I believe, switched. And in Erie, it was not just the Arab American, but the other, the former refugees from Nepal and Tibet and, and other countries that switched over, got organized, registered to vote, uh, and, and switched it over. So, yes. I mean, the smaller minority groups are really growing in both Philadelphia and throughout the state. Um, I want to introduce my friend Al Sharif Nassif, uh, coming from a long distance away uh, and enjoying. Um, hold on, sorry about that. Um, the stamp phones. Um, uh, Al Sharif is involved in all voting is local. He's the, I believe, the regional director. Um, and Al Sharif is Egyptian American, part of our. A broader community and a good friend and Al Sharif I'm just gonna let you go from here talking about how you did it how we got Chinese now on the ballot thank you Marwan for having me uh, good to see uh, some familiar faces and names here um, I just actually I want to start just with a uh, with a uh, with a statistic from our friends over at the uh, at PIC which is the Pennsylvania Immigrant Citizenship Coalition that the newly naturalized citizens in Pennsylvania from, um, you know, that the number that became naturalized between 2014 and 2018, uh, those numbers are almost double the margin of victory during the 2016 presidential election. And the number of naturalized citizens from 2014 to 2020 is triple that margin. Um, and now, you know, our most recent data analysis, um, uh, you know, we, just focusing on Philadelphia uh, finds that you know, between 40 and 8,000 uh, non-Spanish speakers who are voters, but who are limited in English proficiency in Philadelphia alone. And so, you know, I mean, I think, you know, with respect to the refugees who are, who are becoming part of the American fabric, and, we you know, we have to remember that America has always been a place of refugees. I mean, the, the earliest settlers um, were, were fleeing some sort of religious prosecution or, or famine uh, you know, and the waves of immigration was always some some sort of, of, of a refugee crisis that was happening across the world, and people were coming to America to seek refuge. And so, um, you know, th th this is something that's always been part of our fabric. Um, but I, I'm just going to pause there and um, and say that, you know, uh, you know, my work is is, is focused on on um, sort of voting rights. And, you know, All Voting is Local, we're a collaborative campaign has a leadership conference on civil and human rights, which is one of America's largest civil rights coalitions to try to prevent barriers to voting before they happen. Um, you know, and, and doing so is a way to protect our democracy. And, and we want to hold, uphold voting right for every American uh, so we can have a democracy that's truly representative uh, of our strength in diversity, um, you know, an America that works for all of us. Because it, you know, it truly is our diversity that that is a strength. 
and um, you know Philadelphia and, and really Pennsylvania at large has been uh, you know home to, to to a large influx of refugees, people seeking freedom, opportunity, and a better life. Um, and and what we found is that there's a, a major gap in the language capacity. You know, even people who can speak English maybe enough to get by, go get the groceries, you know, uh, go to the pharmacy, uh, et cetera. But I mean, to, to actually fill out a, a government document, and I, mean, I think I think a lot of a lot of you know English voters. Hey, when I tried to vote by mail the first time, you know, English being my first language, I was pretty confused myself. And so, you know, we were in the midst of a pandemic, and where everyone's being told to vote by mail, and I mean, and people are, are struggling to figure this out. So when you add a language barrier to that. And the complexities of, of voting, um, you know, I, I, I think it, what we recognized was there was a major gap, uh, and, and, and what the communities really needed was was language access. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and, and you know, at the end of the day, language is power, right? I mean, language determines whether a person or a community has access to or is shut out from decision making processes, uh, or people, or resources, or information, or services. And so, I mean, our approach to this um, has been to see language access uh, not as a, a, some sort of extra accommodation, but as an equalizer, you know, something that promote, promotes autonomy or, and self-determination, um, ensuring that everyone's voice is heard and that, um, you know, and, and that the, that the uh, basically that interpretation is not just a service to non-English speakers, but it's actually a service to the society at large for everyone who doesn't share a common language. And, um, and, okay. and I think, thank you so much, Al Sharif. I think one of the things that is a result of this now, it had to do with the census, is that Chinese is going to be on the ballot in, in certain areas in Philadelphia, which is really exciting. Now, real quick, I think we got the, and, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up soon, but I think we got the video and the, the picture able to be shown. Pedro, is that, is that true? Bar. And for oh. American media, that's uncivilized. We have all witnessed the Russian invasion of Ukraine unfolding in front of our eyes. The American and European media have detailed the Ukrainian people suffering. Ukrainians are brave, steadfast, and heroic for resisting invasion and occupation by any means necessary, including with Molotov cocktails. Their grandmothers are depicted as courageous wartime field generals. This is where they make the Molotov cocktails. Let those Russian shits come here, she says. Good for you, Granny. How did you learn how to make Molotov cocktails? You Googled it. Of course, she says. Wait, white people are not to Google how to make a Molotov cocktail? That's awesome. Oh, and unlike us Arabs, these Ukrainians are blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and civilized. But this isn't a place with all due respect um you know like iraq or afghanistan you know this is a relatively civilized now the hypocrisy duplicity deceit and whiteness of it all is just too much to respond to with any level of politeness but i'm going to try to address it all with civility courtesy and respect no i'm not you think we're uncivilized since the beginning of the 20th century until right, today i think, I think we can now um, better i think we can stop the the video if people uh want to see the whole video please uh yeah, google it like the uh, ukrainian mo uh, grandmothers are doing don't do molotov cocktails because especially if an arab name the fbi is going to be in front of your door um the two things marwan I, I had i had a molotov um i was trying to drink a molotov cocktail it wasn't good actually um but <laughs> but actually one 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 quick thing uh you said chinese is going to be on the ballot in some places it's across philadelphia Okay. We, yeah, it's um, the Voting Rights Act requires it, so that's a requirement. And Al Sharif and 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 our our team has been working to add other languages beyond the Voting Rights Act requirements, and that's what we're doing. Um, maybe Al Sharif can talk a little bit about that. Can, Pedro, can we show the 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 photograph real quick? That um, uh, visuals usually are important. Um, I mean, I know we all look good up here, but um, if you could show that one video, I mean, I'm sorry, the the picture. Uh, give me a second. Keep 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 chatting. And I, okay. So. Um, and and I'm one more, more real quick thing, Marwan. While yes. while we have a minute, uh, the reason why uh, Chinese is on uh, required is because we did a really good job. We being the collective we uh, for the census, 
Um, there were a lot of people that didn't answer the census, but there were a lot of people that did because we pushed to make sure that they felt like they had to. And if we hadn't done that, we would not have uh, Chinese on the uh, as a requirement of the Voting Rights Act this year. Uh, we were very close, actually. We, we hit the, the threshold because a lot of uh, folks, including like people like Stephanie Sun and who's on here uh, watching and other folks uh, were really pushing the community to to make sure they filled out the census. We're always undercounted. Marginalized communities are always undercounted. But I mean, it's important, and, and we have this- That's what I say, Andy, this time it seemed like he was sort of like part of the strategy. I was reading a report yesterday, I think the, the Trump administration, along with the Commerce Department, um, obviously were, were systematic in terms of suppressing the count in minority communities, right? Yep, yep. And, and I think it's important, I mean, in Philadelphia, you know, let's put in Haitian Creole or, or French for the West African population. We could do Arabic. I mean, the Russian in the Northeast, those are all really important languages and they'll pump up the numbers for voting and then make Philadelphia more powerful. Uh, do we want to open for questions or do anyone have a last? Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's precedence for this, right? I think other jurisdictions, I think Chicago, for example, has language access in their in their voting, right? So it's not what? a unique uh, sort of like uh, issue. Right. Uh, I'll show you, is it a, could we do that as a city or does it have to go through? I mean, obviously the Fe Federal Voting Rights Act made it permissible or forced it to happen in Philadelphia. Uh, can we do it on our own? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I mean, the Voting Rights Act made it made a huge step forward, you know, the, the civil rights community and, and immigrant rights folks have sort of walked uh, in tandem to, to pass this legislation. And it was a landmark piece, but, um, you know, it basically sets a population threshold for um, for certain for certain languages. When they reach that threshold based on the census numbers, they guarantee, it's guaranteed the right uh, to vote in their language. Um, and so, you know, using that as sort of our, our foundational principle, we, you know, decided to go beyond what the federal law requires. And I mean, there's still other, I mean, even if we don't hit a, a population threshold, there's still thousands of people who are limited English proficiency, who are eligible voters, who who need those same types of accommodations. And so, I mean, there, there's definitely a lot of cities that go above and beyond, um, you know, Cook County comes to mind, Los Angeles. And so we've been working with the Philadelphia City Commissioners to sort of plan uh, and, uh, and implement a major expansion in, in the numbers uh, and the um, and the languages that are that are offered both on the voting machines and also working with the DOS and other stakeholders to, um, to you know to ensure that that official voting uh, documents, registration forms, vote by mail applications, um, and other items are available in other languages. Okay, so maybe we can Amanda. I think you're handling the uh, the questions and answers. I correct? am, I am, and if I could just take a moment so, to... Before, uh, before you come on, I just want you to look sorry. at the, the the pictures up there. The difference that the Haitian and the Ukrainian refugees receive. Again, not saying, again, and we're saying over and over again, yes, all the Ukrainian refugees should be warmly accepted and, and embraced by our society, but those refugees in Haiti suffered as well, those Haitian refugees. So, okay, Amanda, sorry to cut you off. It's okay. Um, so I just want to remind all of our guests that they can put their comments or questions into the Q&A tab under the sessions tab. Uh, I do want to notice a, note a comment from Stephanie Sun in our chat. She says that from this primary election, Chinese will be on all voting machines throughout Philadelphia, as well as available for voting official documents throughout Pennsylvania. That's great. Voting official documents, including voter registration and ballots, as well as online voter services provided by Pennsylvania Department of State. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Amanda. Any other questions out there? Uh, I know that uh, Teresa Conejo from uh, uh, Bucks County uh, has been really active on uh, working with the Dreamers in uh, the lower part of Bucks County, and, and she has a lot of history uh, on working on both of these issues here. So uh, I wonder if Teresa has uh, wants to add a couple of comments here. 
Teresa, anything? All right, she might have a step away. So. All right, continue. I'll just comment that, you know, just because you are not a citizen and you don't have voting rights doesn't mean you don't have a voice. So you can still be active in your community. And that's really what we want from all people living in, in communities. Um, we definitely want you, people should vote if they can. Um, but um, if you're a, a new immigrant or refugee, um, you have as much right to express your opinion. This is the United States. So, um, you don't have to speak English. <laughs> you know, we had we had that 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 sign at, at Gino's. Uh, it was a terrible right. sign. This is this is America. Speak English. And and his parents were Italian speaking. So I did. You know, it's like it's so quick that people forget their roots and forget what what the the difficulties that their parents or grandparents or even a couple more generations before them. Um, and most of us are actually first, second or third generation in the United States still, or, or brought over on slave ships. So that's the majority of our country right there. Um, so if you don't remember your history, um, unfortunately we're doomed to repeat it sometimes. So I have a question for uh, Sharif and Andy. So if you live in a community that you have reached the census uh, threshold for language access, but your county board of election is not providing the information in that particular language. What should people do? Yeah, well, I mean, if it's, um, I, I'll take this one in if, uh, if you don't mind. I mean, I mean, if, if it is mandated by um, federal law, then basically like that person, there would have to be a lawsuit. Um, they would have to sue the county um, there were almost a few lawsuits uh, that happened in Philadelphia. Luckily, we're able to sort of work uh, proactively and constructively to, to prevent those lawsuits from happening. But, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, if, if, that, if that does happen, I think, um, I mean, in Florida, I just saw a lawsuit of like 32 counties that weren't complying uh, with, um, with providing Spanish language. And so, yeah, I mean, I mean I, our friends at the Lawyers Committee, um, ACLU, uh, and other organizations have really led the charge on that. And just to add to that, so Philadelphia is a very large municipality, county, 1.44 million, I believe. Um, and so, you know, within that, there are pockets of communities that, that do represent um, a large group of people that speak a certain language. Uh, the problem is it, for in terms of um, the Voting Rights Act um, for the census, they're looking, they only look at the municipality is one. So it would be 1.7. Okay, whatever the number is. Um, um, they look at the whole county and it's a percentage or number of people that that is the threshold. But if you think about it, like if you go into parts of Philadelphia, let's say the northeast part of Philadelphia, where there's a large Arab American population, or a large Russian population or a large Haitian population, you could have a, a, a very large number of people that um, um, are voting eligible that could use language access. And if that was a small town by itself, they would actually cross the threshold for the Voting Rights Act, but because we're treated as a whole county, um, that doesn't happen. And so that's why some of our, our, our rationale of breaking it up is, is to look at it in, in smaller um, portions so that we, we see that there are neighborhoods that are really, um, could be really helped by having language access. So we have another uh, question from Stephanie Sun, um, and this is to any of you To Can the panelists share with the audience what high school students under 18 can do to engage with or help with voting or elections? Um, we see the passion among young uh, generations. Thank you. So, Stephanie, thanks, thanks for that question. I'll, I'll just, before I let these guys do it, because I'm the moderator, I get to do these things. My daughter, uh, and she did this when she was 17. She was an elect. She worked in the election booth, made $250, and spent the day. She's by bi she's bilingual. Uh, spent the day helping people uh, vote and and worked worked in the precinct. So uh, that's something they can do. Uh, Andy Numa or uh, Sharif. 
I think 17 is the age at which you can actually work at the polls yeah. um, legally. Um, but there's always other things you can do, which is to encourage other people to vote or register. But at 17, you can actually apply for and become a um, poll uh, poll worker. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, one of the things, I don't know if we want to go afar on this, uh, but I've been looking at some really interesting uh, policy coming out of New York City where on local elections, they're going to let um, non-citizens vote. Does anyone um, have anything to say about that? I mean, that might, that's good, probably a little far jump in Pennsylvania, but does anyone have any feeling one way or the other? <laughs> Nobody Mima, you hang out in New York. You should. You have relatives up there too. Yeah. Um. In my general sense is that you know you should probably be a citizen to sort of like a vote. I think it's probably a step too far in my viewpoint. Although I do think that you know non-citizens should be granted a license, a driver's license to to work, um, and so forth. I know some states have have done that, but I think sort of like I think the Constitution sort of like you know, calls for one to be a citizen of, of, of the United States. So I'm not sure how that would work from a legal standpoint. Um, though I would like to see- like vote in, in local elections. In local elections. Um, although I, I would like to see Pennsylvania move to granting um, driver's license, uh, you know, uh, to uh, non-citizens, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a difference between undocumented, obviously, and, and non-citizens. Right. Um, I mean, one of the things we need to do here, you know, uh, uh, Sharif, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I can speak for myself on this one, but I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, immigrants are, are just a part, as much a part of the fabric of, of any of the, any city and locality. And I mean, the taxes, the revenue, um, you know, they're also, you know, so I mean, if we go with the principle of taxation without representation, I mean, obviously, you know, the federal government's a different story than the Constitution. But under the local framework, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, one person, one, one vote. And I think you know. I think it. I think that's a, that's a great initiative by New York City um, to, to really uh, make sure that everybody who's living in the community and is part of the community has a voice, regardless of, of the immigration status. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a great initiative by New York City. I mean, you know, I I understand what you know we're saying about um, New York City. I think it's a really interesting experiment, and I'd be curious to see how it goes. But our issue here in Philly is we don't get enough people to vote at all. I mean, we don't get citizens out there. We don't get people over 18. Um, I mean, what's your guess on the number of people who are going to come out to vote in, in May? Uh, will we get, we won't get 50%. Will we get 30% of the people? And, and that's really, you know, problematic. Um, how do we, you know, and we have fewer people going to the polls. And, and in conjunction with many states now trying to make it harder to vote. And so it's this really bad, uh, uh, bad, bad views on the horizon or, or bad possibilities on the horizon. At least in Pennsylvania, I mean, we're not restricting people's vote uh, as much as other states, or, or at least having a Democratic governor make, means that they're not going to add voter ID rules and stuff. But it's important for us as progressives to get out to make sure that our state doesn't revert to where it was under, for example, Corbett, where they try to put voter ID laws around. To, to me, that's the irony, right? Like we have a relatively low voter turnout, especially on sort of like, you know, off your. Sorry. We have uh, low turnout, especially in off year elections. Right. I think in Philadelphia, we average what, like 15 to 20 yeah. percent each election cycle, which is really, really like low and quite frankly pathetic. But yet Republicans have a whole narrative around vo voter fraud. <laughs> like we can't even get people to voluntarily come out and vote. But yet there's this notion that peddling that people are out there voting illegally. Um, I, I just don't get it. Why folks will sort of like, you know, go through that hassle of, of facing jail time, you know, legal issues when we can't even get people that are eligible to vote. So obviously it's it's an effort to suppress the vote. Very, very and scary. And I think there were five people who were actually prosecuted for 
uh, in-person voter fraud in, in Pennsylvania. Five out of how many million? Right. But they were all Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, they were all Trump voters, actually. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, interesting. Exactly. Um, just just to go back to the, the I guess the, the the question of like why how do we get more people to come out and, and really care? Um, so there are a number a lot of answers to that, I think, but you know, a few of them would be one, make sure that people understand like what's the connection to me? Like in fact, local elections are just as important or more important in some ways than the national elections to to and I used to tell people, young people. Uh, when when you get mugged on the corner down the street, are you going to the president or are you going to your city council person or your your elected official locally? And we know that the answer is local is is so important. So um, people have to see or feel that connection and they have to be um, aware of that. And then I, I would say also for young people, one important thing is civics. Um, in, in high school and, and even in college, but in, in high school in particular, um, we haven't been teaching people like what it, what is our system? People can't even, you know, I think new immigrants and refugees coming to take the citizenship test know more about our system than people that live here. That's true. Here. So, yeah. you know, if you have no idea that there are three parts of federal, the federal government, you might think that um, the people that are, you know, tried to take over the Capitol, we're doing the right thing somehow. Um, that that was the that was the point of the, uh, you know, that there was there there's no um, balance of power. Um, so that was one, you know, item. And um, yeah, just just making sure people understand like what their what their voice means in in um, elections. And, uh, and then I would say also, uh, making it easy. Um, so vote by mail is is really, really important. Um, if you think about people who speak a second language or English isn't their first language, it might be easier to do that than to, especially if it's in your language, than trying to figure out where you go to go vote if you're a first time voter and, you know, people, nobody speaking your language at the polling place, um, which has been a problem in Philadelphia. We don't have enough. Uh, and that's why students are, you know, why, why they're looking at students as well as um, bringing another resource. So um, it's a bunch of things, um, making sure people are engaged. And and then finally, I would just say also making, uh, helping to promote uh, folks that maybe look like us um, vote, uh, um, running for election. Um, and then people will feel like, hey, maybe there's somebody like me that's that, that I, I should be thinking about voting. And another thing I think is very important is to look at making Election Day a national holiday. I mean, when you talk about refugees, many of them are, are entrepreneurs, they're working, they're busy. So for them to leave work, you know, uh, might present an issue. And if, if we look at best practices in other countries that get like, you know, north of 80 percent in terms of voter uh, participation, places like, you know, Finland, Sweden, Norway, that's one of the things that they use is sort of like create more time, making it the day that people can sort of like have to themselves to be able to actually go out there and exercise their, their right to vote. Making it on a Tuesday can present a challenge for, for a lot of folks. Hey, I, I love to have another holiday, so we should we should work on this. All right, we're, we're almost at the end of our session. Um, Anybody can, want I, to can I just add one more thing to what? Tarif, uh, what can we do maybe, mm -hmm. and I'm just, because we had talked about potentially uh, what, what we can do to, to get language access uh, and work with that to make sure that our city adds more lang languages. What would you suggest or anyone else have a charge? Yeah, I think what I think, I think Andy had just a point there and, I, and I'd be glad to share um, a few ways that we can take action. Oh, it was just a really small point that um, not necessarily as bad in Philadelphia, but there are some places in the country, especially down south, where if if you try to go vote, you might have to wait in line for two hours, which is totally ridiculous. And we know why that happens. And, and we need to make sure there are enough resources out there to make sure that um, there are enough polling places and, and enough people to make sure that people can actually uh, vote within a reasonable amount of time. Um, not not be like uh, forced away because they have to go do their job after two hours. Right. Uh, Sharif, you want to 
uh, end this session with a charge or with suggestions on how we proceed? Yeah, well, so luckily we do live in a democracy, and and I think our um, you know our, our voices together can really make an impact. And um, you know, so so there's a lot there's things that the folks can do to really amplify our work as a coalition. Uh, Citizens for Language Access has come together, um, you know, almost over a dozen Philadelphia-based organizations. Uh, we put together a petition uh, to all of City Council, uh, asking them to fund the language access expansion. So I'm going to put the, the link for our petition. I um, mean, if you sign this, uh, if, if you sign this petition, it basically will automatically send an email to every member uh, of the Philadelphia City Council. And um, uh, and so please do sign that petition. And the other thing you can do, if you are bilingual, um, uh, reach out to your, your Board of Elections office and volunteer to be a poll worker or a, a bilingual interpreter. And so, um, you know, and, and there's definitely a need. I think there's a huge opportunity to, to shift to make our, our frontline democracy spaces more culturally competent, multilingual, uh, and welcoming for all Americans, regardless of our origin or the language that we speak at home. Thanks, brother. You're on. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, Marwan Kriti, uh, Al Sharif Nesef, Numa San Luis, uh, Andy Toy, and Amanda Green Hawkins. Uh, please uh, stay uh, with our summit for today. We have some really interesting panels coming up. Actually, there's one that's relevant to this, which is the lessons from the 2020 census, what communities learned about what work and, and how we need to be prepared now for the 2030 census beginning now. That's coming up at noon. In addition to that, our keynote speaker, uh, talking about the January 6th insurrection, uh, uh, is uh, Congressman uh, Jimmy Raskin from Maryland, who is a member of the House uh, uh, Committee investigating the, the, the actions of the January 6th committee. And then at the end of the day, we have a really, really interesting conversation uh, about gun violence and suicide and, and how progressives can, can really uh, uh, tackle this issue. And that's being presented by the uh, Giffords uh, organization. Um, so, again, thank you so much for this really interesting and engaging conversation about this very important topic, and uh, stay engaged. Amanda, any last words? No, thank you all for joining us, and um, we look forward to working with you in the future. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Thank, you. thank all right. you all. Thanks, folks. Peace.